Good evening, my name is Caroline Bowman. I'm the director of Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum and I am absolutely thrilled to welcome all of you here tonight. <laughs> Cooper Hewitt's purpose is to inspire, educate, and empower people through design. We do this through exhibitions, online content and discussion, education programs, and the National Design Awards. Programs like tonight's emphasize the important role design plays in our daily lives and how design directly reflects the social, political, and cultural values of our times. As many of you know, Cooper Hewitt is undergoing the most ambitious renovation in our history, expanding gallery space by 60%, restoring historic features, and upgrading our facilities. Nothing about Cooper Hewitt will be the same. It's a massive renovation and historic preservation project, but also a complete re-envisioning of Cooper Hewitt and the Design Museum experience. We've been making quite an effort to keep the flame of Cooper Hewitt alive and burning bright during what will be three years of closure at the 91st Street campus, traveling exhibitions nationally and globally, and holding regular education programs throughout the city. Tonight's talk, generously supported by Cooper Hewitt trustee and design historian Marilyn Friedman, is a wonderful chance for us to highlight our collection and share scholarship and insight about the intersection of music and design dur during a tumultuous time in our history. Our curators and the speakers had a grand time going through about 8,000 objects in our collection that date between 1960 and 1980, among them, over 50 psychedelic posters, numerous album covers, iconic furniture from Werner Panton, Arnie Jacobson, and Herman Miller, tableware, office equipment, textiles, and wall coverings. As you can imagine, a lot of vinyl. <laughs> we are filming tonight, as we always do with our programs, and the talk will be available on our website shortly after the event. In late fall, and no, I am not giving you an exact date yet, <laughs> we will be celebrating the grand reopening of Cooper Hewitt. And one of our first public programs will be the next installment in our Design Re Revolutions, Moore's Historic Design Lecture Series, another outstanding opportunity for those of you who are interested in learning more about our marvelous collection. So I look forward to seeing you all there. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers, Pat, Kirkham, who will be leading tonight's discussion, is Professor of Design History and Cultural Studies at Bard Graduate Center. Joining her are Stephen Duncombe, Associate Professor at the Gallatin School and the Department of Media, Culture, and Communications at the Steinhardt School of NYU. Paula Scher, Principal at Pentagram and the 2013 winner of the National Design Award for Communication and Ben Watson, Executive Creative Director at Herman Miller. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage tonight. Good evening and thanks to everybody who's been involved with organizing this wonderful evening tonight, actually, and especially Sarah Freeman and uh, Marilyn Friedman, wherever you are, I can't see you. Okay, tonight we're going to be mainly looking at the USA and, and Britain, and I just wanted to say that before we start. And we're going to really try and think about this close interrelationships between art, design, music, and popular culture in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Sometimes it's really difficult to prize them apart, and sometimes we will, and other times we'll keep them very, very um, tightly enmeshed. I'm going to start by giving some indication of the very strong crossover between art and design and music in what came to be called the swinging 60s in London. I'm starting with Britain because given my age and my origins, it's one of the things I know a little bit about. Okay. In what's now officially the birth of British blues, they managed to pin it to a particular night. Two of the, um, two of the three younger men in, in the band, um, Keith Scott on piano and my husband Andy Hugenboom on bass, were art students at Hornsey College of Art. And then on drums was a young graphic designer who'd been to Harrow Art School called Charlie Watts. He went on to great fame, as you know, um, with the Rolling Stones. Now, Charlie was working in a graphic design agency in London 
Charles, Charles Hobson and Gray. And then a New York graphic designer arrived there called Bob Gill, some of you may know him. People thought he was great for one reason only, I think. He'd met Sol Bass. <laughs> this was this thing. Do you know this man, my God, you know, this man who, he's, he, he actually went to his house and he knew him. And I think it's really important that for people who are art students and design students at the time in London, in 1955, when this um, man with the golden arm, where graphic imagery was set to music, and in the beginning of a movie that the, the, the still titles moved, that was the very first time that people like Charlie Watts, those art students, Martin Scorsese, 14-year-old boys who were into jazz all over the world, saw what was really abstract art. And it was, it was those graphics and that music that really introduced them to abstraction rather than actually in later years, Jackson Pollock and all the famous American abstract expressionists that we would have in big exhibitions at the American Embassy in London. Okay, some more connections with art. The two of the original Beatles, Stu Sutcliffe and John Lennon, were at Liverpool Art School. And I just show you, because it, I didn't really want to make you think that the, the Beatles were so much cooler and they always wore leather jackets, sometimes at these very moddy clothes by the 60s. And then, of course, Keith and Brian. Well, Keith was an art student at Sidcup Art School. He didn't go very often, he confesses. Brian. Brian was accepted at Cheltenham Art College, but his reference was so bad they wouldn't, wouldn't even have him. And sticking out here on the, on the left, slightly on his own, we've, all, we've already met Charlie. So I could go on and on, but you get the picture. There's very, very tight integration of um, music with art and design uh, that takes us right through um, the, um, the early 60s. So one of the ways that I want you to try and think about this time, really, from the Beatles to punk, I guess, it's a lot to think about tonight, is to think about a whole movement of cultural broadening, diversification, and the reclaiming of the underrepresented, a uh, very fancy way. You know, sometimes people actually talk about punk, but also underrepresented groups like women that we probably won't talk that much about tonight and minorities, and those types of movements coming together in something that we came to call postmodernism, and as a style with a capital P, and Paul is going to um, pick up on that. And I think it's no coincidence that you have this upsurge of interest in craft traditions and design traditions of pre-industrial societies at the very time that the Western economies are moving, as you all know, from a sort of manufacturing base to what we call post-industrial societies, where services and cultural production be becomes much more, more important. And you often look back to, to, to the things that you, you no longer have, or that you have in a different way, that you have as leisure, that you, you have as something to collect. OK, so. As we all know, the swinging 60s start in the 50s, and during the 50s you can see a lot of eclecticism, of wit and whimsy, nostalgia. This acceptance of psychological elements of design as well as the rational. The blurring of barriers between many things previously thought to be antithetical, and there's a bit of a list, but I think they're all important and all going to be important tonight. So. What used to be binary oppositions, let's think about them as a big continuum. You know, modernity and tradition, they're not opposed. If you put them on a continuum, people and music and objects have their places across that broad spectrum. Past and present, machine and hand production, national and international and global, function and aesthetics. The amateur and the professional, I think we're going to see considerable blurring of that tonight. Hetero and gay, high and low culture, the material and the immaterial. 
So for me, this notion of the continuum is important. And also, I think this idea of melange, the mixing together of very disparate and different um, objects, that help us get that really constant and free flow of, of influences, you know, from politics. And I think that's crucial always to music, to art, to design, to popular culture. To have a little quick look back at some of these things in the 50s, particularly this fascination in the, even the late 40s and 50s with the Edwardian and Victorian periods. And it seems to me that that allows people to go back. It's almost an excuse to go back because modernism was, had supposedly banished us all from looking at those things, to think about, you know, luxury, glamour, um, even old-fashionedness, and, and, and to be nostalgic. And I wanted to point out that the, Ted's, the Teddy Boys in England get their name, actually, from Edward, from, Edward, from the Edwardian period, because of these great so-called Edwardian jackets and the, what then we thought were terribly tight Edwardian, Edwardian trousers. This is what all the bad boys at my school wore and when they, went to court, when they went to court for whatever it was, fighting on a Saturday night, they came in to the grammar school where we all had our uniforms. They came in wearing these clothes and then they would open their jackets to have these amazing coloured linings and things. And they were... Um, but they were the heroes in, in many ways. <laughs> Some of those British teddy boys used to get called punks, and I've been thinking a lot about that, this American term of, of a slur upon someone. And um, in fact, in Britain, teenagers were very much looking here, very much looking at American popular culture. It's about all we thought about. And of course, you know, I can't show them all, but James Dean, you know, Rebel Without a Cause of 55. The first time I remember someone saying to me, do you like Elvis Presley? I was in the church choir. And I said yes, because I really fancied the guy and ran home and said to my brother, you have to tell me about this person, you know. <laughs> um, and then I had my first pair of American jeans in the 1950s and T-shirts. Um, so I think there's this lot of um, cross-cultural and cross-national um, things, things going on this evening. And talking about cross-national, the, the Cold War is an important backdrop here. You know, by 1950, both the US and the USSR have, have weapons of mass destruction. The thoughts that somebody else has an atomic and a hydrogen bomb um, you know, I found it really hard, but probably a lot of you in the audience remember all the civil defense drills you had. We didn't have very much like that. But here there was a very great fear of nuclear attack. Some people still thought, you, know, you can see here Walt Disney is one of them, that science was benevolent, that there was no problem. Other people, and I choose again a British example, had a very different view of what, what would happen if um, people dropped bombs instead of finding some other political solutions. And this is Henry in, in 1963 in Britain, you know, the atomic bomb imagery, but with his skull, and there's a lot of skulls and bomb imagery actually in, in, in the 1960s. So whilst we're thinking it's all peace and love and flowers, there is this threat there behind it. And that actually, I think, is why there is such a lot of emphasis and why the peace movement is so strong. And I show you here what I think is perhaps the greatest graphic symbol of the period we're looking at, which is um, 1958, the CND symbol, kind of campaign for nuclear disarmament, designed by a British designer who's also a pacifist. Okay? And just to also remember that protest is connected to politics. And I've been doing a lot, I'm working on the American um, blacklist, and the Eames has knew some people on the blacklist, so I'm, I'm all into that at the minute. But Pete Seeger, of course, was blacklisted. As, and, and 
in a lot of the hearings, the anti-communist hearings, they say, you belong to the People's Song Movement in 1946. And, you know, this shows you're a communist. And so um, just, just even um, be, belonging to something as, you know, we would think of as neutral as American um, folk music had a lot of political implications. And, of course, those 1950s struggles for, for uh, protest struggles and civil rights struggles in particular fed very much in, into the um, protests of the 1960s. And Pete Seeger is, I think, important because, for me, he was somebody I knew about in two different ways in the, in the 1960s. At the same time, through folk clubs, but then through, through Bob Dylan. And here is Freewheeling 1963, which I think is a really kind of interesting album. You know, you have these contemporary words through traditional melodies. It opens as blowing in the wind. That becomes that great anthem of the 1960s. And Dylan talks about civil rights, he talks about the anxieties of nuclear war, but this isn't a cover that looks like Henry and there's no skull, there's no atomic bomb, there's not that big peace symbol. There's just him and Sarah strolling down the street. And that's another part of the 1960s, this new informality in our lives, this greater informality in terms of dress, in terms of address. Um, to each other. So I think, in, in many ways, this album is so unslick compared with before then. And I just, that's another story again. But you know, trying to make musicians look glamorous, even Bill Haley, you were always trying to make people who weren't terribly glamorous look glamorous. Okay, so we will leave um, Bob Dylan for a moment. And I just want to, this is. Nixon and Khrushchev having <laughs> bitter words in Moscow in 59. You probably all know it, the so-called kitchen debate. And of course, Nixon's big card is that capitalism can produce this super, super abundance of, of goods. And, and the Eameses said, who were in, in Moscow then, said it was really embarrassing that the Americans were showing pop-up toasters and really, they didn't think that that was the best thing to represent American society. Most people, I think, particularly after the war and the Depression, you know, most people welcome this superabundance of goods. But there are critics in the 50s and 60s. And I'll just show you quickly here one of Franz Papard's, you know, The Waste Makers. It's the last of his trilogy of... Um, you know, the hidden persuaders, the status seekers, and then 1960, the waste makers. And this critique, this anti-materialist critique, again, I think feeds back into music time and time again. And of course, at the same time, corporate culture in the US, it's expanding more rapidly at any time than the world has ever known before. It's this massive, massive phenomenon. And the music industry is right in the middle of that, as is the film industry. And so popular culture is really embedded very, very tightly in, in, into that. Right, another element. You're seeing images tonight, actually some of them we could, it's impossible to reproduce this now in a book because the, um, the rights are so deeply um, confused and um, Anyway, we'll talk about that later. So, pop art. Again, most people think it's Britain in the mid-50s with the independent group being obsessed with American popular culture, with making art and design by cutting up American adverts and reading comic books. And I know there was a great... Um, a great outcry in the States that that was supposedly the cause of juvenile delinquency and then they all thought that if we read them in Britain we would have as many delinquents as you did here. The independent group turned this around and say, no, no, here's this very vibrant popular culture. And then 1967, I remember this because I was very political 
what the hell is going on, you know? What do I make of this album? You know, it's, there's a lot of stuff about the fairground, there are floral designs of a type you would only see in a not very good municipal garden. There are these uniforms that are not like the kind of cool ones we would wear to go down the King's Road. These are like bad theatrical ones in bang-up colours. So what is going on? And it seems to me that it's evoking the world of fancy dress, of dressing up, of vaudeville, of even maybe the new romanticism. The outfits have been described as anti-establishment, but everything they wore was called anti-establishment, so I think we kind of don't think about that. But I do think it relates to McCartney's notion of the whole album, is that you make this fictitious band, you create an alter ego, and then you can do what you like musically, and then you can do what you like in terms of identity. It's about performing a, per a performance. And that's what we all did for a lot of time. We used to go to work dressed like this, really, or to put tutorials and things with, with, with clothes like this. It was, um, anyway, I said no autobiography tonight. <laughs> this album cover cost 3,000 pounds at a time when most album covers cost 50 pounds or less. And I know that Stephen and other people are going to be talking about, you know, amateur, professional, top-end quality, and, you know, as opposed to things that you would be running off by hand on a Romeo machine or something. So I just want to mark this one as, um, you know, this is by um, Peter Blake, the um, British... <laughs> British um, pop artist and his, his American collaborator. And, you know, he had a very traditional training in, um, in, in printmaking, which he's gone back to. But he was just saying, you know, John Lennon at one stage wanted Adolf Hitler in here, you know. And so it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a hard one to unpick. That album contains a song called Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And <laughs> millions of pages on the internet still debating does, does the girl with kaleidoscope eyes that comes out of the sky, is it LSD or not? You know, I'm not going into that. But some of you know that um, you know, I write and talk a lot about the Eameses and it did strike me that, um, that there are some Eames images. There were these two Eames films, Kaleidoscope Shop and then Kaleidoscope Jazz Chair that are much earlier than the 67 um, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And people often say to me, were the Eames as on drugs? I go, no, no way, no way. Um, on the other hand, the 901, the Royal College of Art asked them, because he was this famous industrial designer and his artist wife, they wanted to know what their workshop was like. The Eames thought that would be boring. So they were then really, as always, interested in re-looking at the world in different ways. And so they showed this. The students loved it, and the faculty, industrial design faculty, hated it. I mean, what on earth? And then, because I'm moving on quickly, the carousel horse is 61 again. I always call it Herman Miller's sort of precursor of Sergeant Pepper. They're dressing their showrooms very, very inventively with all of this stuff, the sort of stuff that the Eames has had in the house and we call cross-cultural surprise. And Ray used to say, well, we, we didn't think of it as decoration, so we called it functioning decoration. Well, it's still decoration. Then um, Milton Glaser with pop and this very sort of swirling up art intersecting with, you know, this huge interest in uh, Art Nouveau, huge interest in Art Nouveau from that period. And um, this is, I think, you know, he's taking what we would think of as maybe psychedelia into mainstream music promotion. This is CBS. This is, again, top, top, of, top of the line. I've been buying these recently since I have a grandson. Um, 
told Dylan, so I quite like the notion that there's no Bob on it, that it can become, uh, it can become a Welsh name if you, if you want. So this seems to me to go back to the, the big, bold German posters of the 1900s and 1910s, as well as Art Nouveau, as, as, as you know, a, a lot of images. And I know we're going to pick up on this later, so I'll move straight to the kind of, again, our part, Art Nouveau, feeding into what are much, I think, more delirious, kaleidoscopic melanges of posters for rock concerts and festivals in San Francisco, sorry, from 66 onwards. These are by Wes, Wes Wilson, who's a sort of philosophy dropout, but with, with a real um, a real sort of untrained, but, but I think very genuine artistic talent. Other people, um, you know, Rick Griffin ha had some formal training. So you get a lot of sort of women with undulating hair, you know, you can, you can see it and it's reformulated. And often the graphics are really hard to decipher. It's a kind of, maybe Paula can comment on this, I don't know. It's the kind of trick, it's the puzzle. You know, where do you want to be on Saturday night? You know, oh, I see 24, it's the 25, it's three nights. You finally, you finally get there. And I put the woman's body there to remind myself, really, that by 1968, especially here in the States and very soon afterwards in Britain, a lot of people would be, women would be at these concerts but start to be thinking about, well, why is it always a woman's male body that's here, and the, the beginnings of discourse about, you know, gratuitous I imagery and things. So, again, not something we can go into tonight, but, but part of that pop culture and part of a moment where it's... I mean, the women's movement is says to start in 68, but of course it's, it's building up then. So I think images that are already being slightly uh, problematized in, in, um, in people's heads. So then, probably the first woman designer we, we have of the evening, who only really, this is Bonnie McLean, she gets her chance when her husband, Graham, the promoter, falls out with Wells Wilson. And she's been doing the sort of, you know, Wilson-type designs on chalkboards, little handouts, basically the amateur end of the work. And then, because of this fallout, She's allowed to um, design the big posters for a while, but then sadly I found out that they found some other men with better training that they liked better, so he just dumped her again. But anyway, just to kind of give this picture, and this Cooper Hewitt really does have a great collection of these, and they, what I think is really interesting about them that that they took ones that, that weren't necessarily the, the greatest arty ones. And I think it's, in terms of a popular culture collection, it's, it's really important. So here we have New Year's Eve 1970. This moment, you know, love, peace, flowers, San Francisco. And I thought, my God, I went there a year later, you know, <laughs> thinking it was all going to be like this. Well, it almost was. And my very last image, sunglasses everywhere, um, and more naked bodies. And I just wanted to end with Victor Moscoso, who did have a very, very, um, a, a double um, design training in a way. Commercial world of graphics, academic training at Yale with no less than Joseph Albers and Heather Matter. So you have the sort of modernist theory He's been in commercial graphics, and then he wants to do something that's to do with a culture that he feels is his own, and so moves to produce these himself. Very high quality, things he can bring home, and I'm seeing my winding up, and it's right on time, so thank you. Pat, thank you. I'm going to spend just a few minutes this evening, maybe taking a terribly unexpected tact, 
Um, but from a worldview of one that's um, directed from my place at Herman Miller, that's not um, only about the intersection of furniture design, perhaps where we are best known, but about all the aspects of design that were coming from a corporate culture that ultimately decades on started to influence popular culture today. But actually, how we can look at that as a, a hotbed of interdisciplinary design, and I hope to actually touch on many of the things that, that Pat started to, and actually maybe give us some reasons to look at the output of the designers of Herman Miller during this period in a very different way. So as a, as a quick orientation, this is a, a lovely photograph that um, gathered around um, the eyes closed um, George Nelson and the most elderly behind him, D.J. Dupree, the, the founder of, of Herman Miller. And of course, um, to the right of the image, Charles and Ray Eames, um, Alexander Gerard up front and a little bit off to the side and feeling a bit awkward, um, Robert Propes, the, the inventor and designer. And really it was the fantastic union, the magical union um, that, and trust and relationship that Dupree and Nelson created together. Um, Nelson, um, excuse me, do, uh, DJ in his own words, abandoned his, himself to design and abandoned the company to design and, ex and an extraordinary amount of trust he gave to Nelson to actually instill design everywhere in the company. So what I'm gonna spend a few minutes doing is talking less about the expected furnishings or products of design, um, but all aspects of design at the company um, that was not only centered from this nucleus of folks, um, but folks beyond that. And as we look at everything from architecture to exhibitions uh, to graphics and um, textile design and beyond, uh, perhaps we'll be able to uncover a few consistent or, or continuous themes. So maybe starting at the very center, um, Charles and Ray, Ray at their home in Pacific Palisades. Um, and so for a moment to detour, even though this isn't a, a Herman Miller project, um, it was a project in architecture and obviously um, extremely well known. Um, I love that Pat used the word um, melange. I want to use the word collage, um, which is absolutely something that runs consistently through, through popular art and design and is core to the work of, of the Eameses. And perhaps it's nowhere better expressed in their thinking about their architecture but also their interior. And so, the Eames um, were extraordinary collectors and collage artists. Um, certainly, um, Ray was a, an extraordinary one unto her uh, own. Um, but together, they had an attitude that um, more is always more. And that the, the ability to create, um, and this we'll, we'll have a chance to look at some other spaces as well, but to create a place that seen, is full of juxtapositions, full of places along a spectrum, um, that is extraordinary, whether they're personal collections from travels, um, bits from the studio, um, blankets or gifts from friends or tea sets for tonight. It all feels just right. Um, the, it's functioning uh, decoration. Um, the Eameses also did an extraordinary amount of uh, showroom design for Herman Miller beginning um, in the 50s. This is a, a shot from the New York showroom in the 50s. Um, and you start to see this use of abstraction, um, uh, obviously the, pro the product of their design being treated in a very abstract way. Um, but when we move to, um, I didn't even know that Pat was gonna show that soldier, but there you see it. <laughs> um, uh, here in a, uh, a showroom in New York. Um, and so you start to see popular art entering their vocabulary as they thought how to create stories or storytelling in places where furnishings could be sold, um, whether that's a uh, flat art built from a children's toy in the background, um, the, the exploded graphics, or if you look to the far left of the image, um, large-scale photography. So this collage of multiple media, of course they continued that um, throughout their careers, they worked in, in film and beyond, but very interesting to see that entering the commercial realm um, of showroom interiors. I have a few shots now of, of, a, of an Eames design of a, of a showroom in the early 60s in Los Angeles. Again, a different approach to collage where the, you can combine um, objects as extraordinary as a Giacometti, um, as banal as a Boston fern, um, hoping um, those will help you look at a plastic chair a little bit differently. Um, 
but I want to spend a moment looking at that tumbleweed. Um, the ability to, um, and so one big idea I think that was central um, happening here in, among this hot butter designers was collage. The other is this appropriation of the everyday or the use of everyday objects. And the tumbleweed happens to be my favorite example. Um, we could find it in their use of seed packets on walls, um, jars of candy on tables, um, and I'm talking about the penny candy um, um, that probably costs far less than a penny. Um, but this appropriation of the everyday, whether that was um, Andy Warhol putting an abstracted banana on an album cover, or a, um, a tumbleweed um, presented as art, or um, I'll take a stretch to call it decorative functionalism, um, was something that the, that the Eames and indeed the milieu at, at Herman Miller was doing a fantastic job with and really exploring. I'm going to jump to a, another author, and in this case to Alexander Girard, um, but stay in the, in the realm of interiors and exhibition. Um, Girard is best known, and the Cooper, of course, has an extraordinary um, amount of uh, Girard's holdings in textile design as well as um, a great deal of his draft graphic work. Perhaps he's less well known as, an, as a fantastic um, curator himself and indeed an interior designer uh, really with, uh, without compare. And so um, Girard, it would, it would be, I'd be remiss not to inter use him to interject my next major theme, which is that of the use of color and the, the extraordinary combinations of color that are unexpected, powerful, um, and in fact demanding to um, anyone who arrived to this, to this era um, from the years immediately previous. Um, perhaps the, um, the best ex example of, and, of this work of Girard was at his textiles and objects um, store. Um, which opened in 1961 um, here in the city. Here you see the in opening poster of his design as well. Um, and a few shots of the interior. Um, and if we didn't use the wor word colorful, we would be remiss. Um, I'll also use this image to help um, take us to the, the next major theme running through an extraordinary amount of this work, which is multiculturalism or a real look to a broader world. And indeed, uh, Mr. Girard and his wife were extraordinary travelers. Um, their personal collections of folk art um, from around the world, from India to Ethiopia um, and far beyond, is uh, both has a permanent home at the uh, Folk Art Museum in Santa Fe, which, which they created, designed, and, and bequeathed. Um, but also was the heart of the textiles and objects store which he created. So you see notions of that, whether they're tapestries, um, objects, um, uh, jars of candy in the back there. Um, but this, um, here a Girard designed um, poster um, announcing a sale at, at, the, at the TNO shop, um, both gives us that notion of there's clearly influences from, from India, from Mexico, and uses of, of color and um, combination, um, which allows me to start to move into maybe some um, graphic executions um, from additional artists, uh, um, and those particularly from the Nelson studio, um, perhaps most notably um, several designs uh, done by Irving Harper. So here, uh, uh, the first advertisement um, at the launch of what we now call the um, Eames Aluminum Group collection, which was known as the Indoor Outdoor Group um, at the time when it was first designed actually for a uh, Girard designed interior for the Irwin Miller House. So all these folks were um, terribly woven together in their work, um, but that abstraction of the bird cage and the flying bird, um, the um, positive and negative of the yellow and the white, um, we start to see um, that repeated use of collage, and here I wanted to, to grab a spread from a, um, done by Ray Eames, a simple spread from she did on a piece in, in art and architecture. Um, continuing the graphic theme, again, um, some work from the, from, from the Nelson studio, um, two adverts, um, again, focused on the, on the aluminum group, but here, the bold use of color 
the strong use of, of form seems very, 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 very powerful, um, and indeed, um, at the time, even a little bit shocking. The next few images I have um, allow us to focus um, back on, on Mr. Girard. Um, and indeed, over his um, 20 plus years with Herman Miller, Alexander Girard designed over 350 uh, textiles, um, hundreds of wallpapers, an uncounted number of graphics to support those programs. And that was just his output for Herman Miller alone, uh, let alone those for the other clients he supported as well. When we look at this, six out of 350 isn't, isn't much, um, but it starts to give us a sense of that approach of that, um, the, his influences from around the world, um, his extraordinary uses and ability to, um, to bring color together in surprising and, and complementary ways. Girard um, also authored a series of what were called environmental enrichment panels. Um, the bulk of these uh, done in the early 70s, this one Hand and Dove. Um, and here it's actually, I think, very easy to see the connections um, to some of the uh, work which Pat was just sharing with us, whether it's Hand and Dove um, um, or the Three Eyes. And I also wanted to, to use this as a, as a stepping point to realize that those, that design work that was happening inside the corporate culture that was Herman Miller was not contained just to those names that we know, but actually created a culture that, that sponsored um, design in everything that happened. And so also in the, in the collection of the Cooper, a series of posters designed by um, our colleague Steve Frickholm, and, and Steve is here this evening, which was these posters done once a year for 20 years were simply to announce the internal company picnic. Um, and yet they're... Um, Often they were done moments before the picnic began. Uh, <clears throat> but their ability to um, abstract forms, um, take everyday objects, the, the ham and the pineapple, um, but to cause us to look at them in a, in a fresh way, um, I think are all, uh, they're both visual reminders of the, of the pop moment, uh, <laughs> but also um, powerful uh, pieces of communication unto themselves. Thank you so much. So um, when I was uh, 22, I moved to New York City, and um, I began working in the record industry. And I was hired by a man named uh, John Berg at CBS Records. Uh, he's the art director of um, Free Wheeling, the cover that was shown. The photograph was uh, by Don Hunstein, who was the in-house photographer, who was sent down to take the picture, and they, they just turned up that way, and he snapped the shot, as so many of those things were. And you don't know when you're working whether or not something is going to have any kind of historical value or not. You're, you're simply functioning in a period of time. And at that point in time, I was dating and then married a man named Seymour Quast, who was Milton Glaser's partner in a business called Pushpin. The um, Dylan poster was a giveaway inside an album called Blonde on Blonde, which was Dylan's album, and all those pieces came together, and they were art-directed, designed, and put together at a moment in time, and nobody knew it, anybody would think it would be iconic or that you would remember it at all at any time later. I began working first at Atlantic Records, uh, doing record covers, and then CBS, and I worked in a very specific way. I hated the typeface Helvetica, <laughs> and I, I absolutely refused to design in any way, shape, or form in the international style, which was prevalent. Um, my heroes were Pushpin and Victor Moscoso. Those were the people that drove me through the 60s. And in the 70s, what I did is made analogies, jokes, and parodies. So this was a title of an album was Common Sense. It was a picture of a farmer about to step on a rake. The style of the typography is ripped right off of, John, you know, it's Caslon. It's right out of the Common Sense pamphlet. And these were the kinds of ways I designed things. Um, if I had a title of an album like uh, Ginseng Woman, it sounded mysterious to me, sort of like something out of Murder, My Sweet. 
And um, I would hire illustrators. This is David Wilcox. The type is Art Deco. That's the way I designed at the time. It seemed like a, a 30s or 40s movie image that happened to be color. And to Pat's point about sexism in the record industry, I got a petition from the National Organization of Women protesting violence to women on record covers <laughs> for this particular illustration. At the moment, working inside the world's most sexist company, <laughs> they were thrilled a woman had done it. I had to answer the petition and thank them for contacting me and <laughs> ask them if they could do anything about my raise. <laughs> This was an album cover that I always thought was very mediocre. Um, designed in 1976 for a one-hit wonder band called Boston that came out, sold seven million copies, and only three months ago it was alluded to on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me when they were talking about the world blowing up and the spaceships leaving the Earth like the Boston cover. I cannot believe that something from 1976 still can permeate a conversation. Um, one friend of mine told me when I died, my obituary would say, design the Boston cover. <laughs> a nightmare. <laughs> um, a lot of the, the projects I did were um, uh, working directly with recording artists who had cover approval and uh, you built relationships with them and they were my first clients. And I have to say, everything I know about running a business, talking to clients, meeting with people, persuading people came from this crazy experience in the music industry for 10 years. And, and I, you know, I, I think about uh, how I got people to buy into things. I remember Muddy Waters was terrified of his face being that big on a cover, but I, I offended him even more by making the shirt pink. Um, <laughs> Here he is by Richard Avedon. Um, at CBS, you could hire the best photographers, the best illustrators. The budgets were big. It was an amazing job, and I thought everybody in the world had the same kind of job and had no idea how lucky I was. Uh, also by Avedon, Johnny and Edgar Winter. And a series of covers for Bob James, which were very slick and, and very powerful. They were all large objects uh, blown up out of scale. And you have to realize you're looking at things that are 12 and a half by 12 and a half inches um, that just seemed um, big and lush. These were all from that series. And the best one being the matchbook. Um, I think at that time, they actually, uh, in Japan, made a matchbook that was 12 and a half inches. You had to light it like this. So. <laughs> But what fascinated me most was uh, working with uh, eclectic typography and period typography. And I would draw it and have it redrawn. Um, and I used it on many covers, most of them jazz and classical, because uh, usually in jazz and classical art artists, the, the record company didn't care about it very much because they didn't sell very many records. So I would, I would work on something very large scale, like Bruce Springsteen or Billy Joel, and then I could do a Jean-Pierre Rampal cover and nobody cared. <laughs> it's true. But um, this was, I guess, what would be termed as, as uh, postmodern. I mean, I, I began working with these uh, eclectic forms of typography in about 1975. I think this one was 1976. And I did it because it was difficult. It was difficult to draw this typography. You couldn't find it anymore. You couldn't, you couldn't order it out of a type book. You, couldn't, uh, you had to create your own photostats from things and redraw them. There was no computer. So the challenge of it made it, made it fun to do. Um, this was, I think, one of the last ones I did in 82. And I, I have to say that all of this work really informed my career for a very long period of time. And also, um, I learned typography from borrowing from the past, which was great, and began working with constructivism. And then this was New Disc, and New Disc was um, actually uh, began in the 80s, and it was a 10-inch record cover. Things were starting to shrink. And these were sort of uh, you know, punk artists, and they were done inexpensively and uh, were really kind of a lot of fun. But at the end of them, the um, covers turned into about six by six, and I was done. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. I'm going to start with um, an image that Pat put up, which this is Milton Glaser's um, Bob Dylan poster, <coughs> 1966. Um, it's a beautiful design by a respected graphic designer. 
and worthy of its place in the Cooper Hewitt collection. Um, Eleven years later, in 1977, we get this. Um, it's a very different music scene. It's, it's punk rock with a very different creative and aesthetic ethos. Really born in the mid-1970s, uh, travels through the 1980s and into the 90s, and even continues today, although in the wake of desktop publishing and uh, desktop computers, we could have a conversation about whether it's, a, it's an um, nostalgia at this point. Um, but this was essentially the aesthetic of punk rock that you would find in things like fanzines. Um, and it was based around this ethos. It's one of my favorite of all time graphics. This is from the fanzine Sideburns 1977, which you saw before. I'll read it to you because it's a little hard. It's playing in the band, first and last in a series. This is a chord. This is another. This is a third. Now form a band. Um, and and this was uh, this was the the ethos of uh, do it yourself. Um, it was the celebration of the amateur. It was largely a reaction against the professionalization of music and actually the professionalization of design that was happening in the late 1960s and into the, into the early 70s. Um, it basically said to anyone who is listening that anyone can play music, anyone can be a creator. You learn three chords and you form a band. Um, this is my little bit of autobiography. 15 years old, I listened to the Ramones, Blitzkrieg Bop. Uh, it's three chords. I realized, hey, if they can do it, I can do it. Uh, and I formed a band. Uh, and within six months, we were playing out. And I'll tell you, I was terrible. <laughs> uh, but it didn't matter, because we were a punk band. Uh, and this amateur DIY, DIY ethos followed into the graphic elements of punk rock. Um, here's some fanzine covers. This is Unite from Germany. This is Life, Liberty in the Pursuit of, I don't know where it goes, uh, Suicidal Tendencies. Uh, this is from, uh, that's from US back there. This is from Ireland, Radioactive. And this is a long time running um, American one, uh, Maximum Rock and Roll. This is actually relatively recent, but the aesthetic hasn't changed. Um, this also, this aesthetic um, style was not about only about the covers, but also the interiors of these um, fanzines. Here's a typical layout in Maximum Rock and Roll. Another typical fanzine layout. And another typical fanzine layout. Um, as you can see, it's about cut and paste. It's about moving around type. It's about collage. It's about bricolage. It's about um, melange. Um, nothing is new in that way. What is new, however, is I think the celebration of the amateur creator. Um, that is, is that the style is not unique at all, actually. We've seen it for hundreds of years. Um, but the privileging of the aesthetic skill of the everyday, the creator, the non-professional, perhaps is. And again, you see this on posters, celebrate the coming apocalypse. <laughs> this is from the US. This is fear. Um, from the U.S., Bad Brains, um, early 1980s. It's from a Latin American uh, punk show. It shows that this becomes the international style, if you will, of punk rock. And my favorite of all of these, the sloppy flyer. <laughs> uh, Self-described sloppy flyer. Um, but even um, uh, major punk albums from major albums, uh, major labels use this style. Um, here's the Sex Pistols debut, um, Never Mind the Bollocks, in 1977. Um, and the idea here, again, is that the aesthetic was amateur. Key to every punk rock aesthetic is this idea that you can do it yourself. That is, it is about emulatability. Um, if design, in many ways, is about virtuosity, professional design, punk rock design was really about, it is so terrible that you could probably do a better job yourself. <laughs> now, now go create a fanzine or create a poster, okay? Um, anyone can do it, so can you. Now form a band, create a fanzine, book a show. Um, and this is at the core of punk rock and punk culture. Um, I spent some time looking through the Cooper Hewitt's really amazing collection. I'd always get sidetracked. That was the problem. Uh, an hour later, I'd realize, no, I'm supposed to be looking at punk images. Um, and for some representations of punk aesthetics, and I'm sure I missed some stuff, but what I did find was this, which is beautiful design um, by a very talented graphic designer. This is uh, Tibor Kalman and uh, Emin Company. Um, and it's thoroughly professional, it's beautiful, and it's very appropriate for a collection. Now, this raises a question for 
the archiving of punk rock material. Because this valorization of amateur design, um, what does an institution, whether it be a collection like Cooper Hewitt, or an archive of graphic design, or books, or historical material, do with work which is understandably not very good to look at, not very impressive. That is, institutions are interested in the best of, but what happens if the best of, within the standards of the culture which is producing the culture, actually is some of the worst? Sloppy, slapdash, short-lived, and let's face it, by design standards, often pretty ugly. Um, and so I want to just leave you with this, which is, what do we do with this? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name's Gail Davidson. I'm the curator of drawings, prints, and graphic design at Cooper Hewitt. Um, and uh, there was a, there's a reason why uh, you found a dearth of punk material uh, in our department, um, and that's because um, until now, <laughs> um, I didn't particularly appreciate it. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, as a uh, personal uh, formalist, um, uh, I found, have found it off-putting. And also because it's not part of my personal culture growing up. I mean, I can relate to all the Beatles stuff and all of that, uh, but um, I was married um, with children uh, during the punk period um, and therefore um, uh, found, find it challenging and hard to take. Um, but I think that your question is very valid. Um, uh, what should a museum be collecting? Um, and uh, because obviously we want to document uh, design um, and it presents uh, a real challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of this stuff is very ephemeral. I mean, I don't even know where I can find it, if could find it, mm -hmm. if I wanted to go look for it. And maybe you can help us uh, yeah. <laughs> um, recover uh, some of this material. Yeah, I actually don't know if you should collect it. Um, I mean, I, I mean I, I'm being honest about that. It, it's my, uh, I wasn't making a case for collecting it, actually. <laughs> uh, it's just to sort of ask a question, which is, how does one think about things like the best of um, within a culture in which the best of often was the most upsetting, the most sloppy, the most unprofessional. Um, and so I'm not sure what to do. It really is an open question. I actually get very upset that, uh, at the idea that this would be collected. And I've seen them now in nice, pristine plastic bags and things like that, and it sort of horrifies me. Um, they're supposed to be thrown out. They were given about 20 minutes of thought putting together. Um, and so that brings up a question, which is, again, an aesthetic question, which is, what is the best of the worst? Um, and how do we even think about something like that? Sorry, Gail was saying she can see, you know, maybe collecting because of connections with Russian constructivism. We had a very clear example of futurism or something. Um, actually, my reaction is that <coughs> I think it's more difficult for museums that are labeled art and design museums to collect what, you know, is another category. It's just all about categories in many ways. Um, because museums say, you know, I'm thinking of Glasgow's People's Palace. They happily have Billy Connolly's banana boots in there, and they happily have Glasgow's punk 
history in there, and it, it, to me it doesn't feel out of place, and I actually would like this history to be re remembered in a way. So for me, I think there's, you know, you're raising an aesthetic point, but I think it's also about um, being more proud in a way of our popular cult culture heritage. I would, I would say also, if I, if I can just say something, uh, Gail, is that when you look at this, you see David Carson in the 90s, and that, that these, these are sort of touchstones. So some of them were, you know, they were done with the purpose of not looking professional, but of course they were very professional at it. I mean, that, that this wasn't totally naivete, and I remember how some of that was done. So it's not, but, but you begin to visually accept it is what happens. So that, you know, I look at the, the, the Sex Pistols cover and it's so iconic that it looks like it's absolutely expertly done yeah. to look that way. Yeah. And that then people emulate it and it becomes part of the vernacular. Mm -hmm. So that I think it's really not determining, you have to determine, I think, to a degree what's important, like what was the influence of it after, after it passed? And I think that may be a criteria that you mm -hmm. might consider. consider. There's somebody back there with a... Yes, and I did want to uh, uh, just to say thank you for Gail, which I thought was a very brave and open um, <laughs> curatorial comment. You, you, it was, and it needs um, complimenting. I saw somebody at the back. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned the, the Sex Pistols. I mean, this was Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood. They thought very, very carefully about the images that they put out there. So I thought, I think it's interesting that you put the Sex Pistols and didn't put up, I don't know, the New York Dolls or uh, Iggy Pop or any other graphics that they perhaps used here in New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just threw that up to show that how Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood were very self-conscious about grabbing from the styles which were around them and making them into something beautiful. And I think you can really see that in Vivian Westwood's fashion design. And we were talking about earlier that one of the places where punk design actually has moved into the institution is actually around fashion. Um, but uh, I, we could have put all sorts of albums up there and so on. The albums are a little bit tricky. Maybe you can talk about this because at the moment you come out with an album, of course, you're moving it away from the amateur and into the professional, professional realm. Professional is professional. Yeah, job. and so it's more about the appropriation of a style which is at that time being created. Um, but then, of course, reinforces the style which will come later. Well, what was interesting to me always about the punk movement because I worked inside CBS Records, which was a corporation. <clears throat> was that the whole goal of it was to look anti-corporate, that you were, not, you were not being, you know, packaged by these, you know, hucksters who were, <laughs> who were gonna sell millions of records at your expense. So that, that, was, that was also part of the movement. It was so anti that. I mean, and, and you know, they would, I had to, I had to put, put some of those things out, you know, as they would arrive, and the goal would be make sure it's messy, you know, that you don't, you know, so it, it is a style, and it's, it's, it was deliberate. It, it isn't accidental. I mean, I was just thinking about the Sex Pistols. Um, I wanted to reproduce the image that still has a lot of problems, I think, in Britain, which is the queen with a safety pin through her nose. <laughs> and um, even more since she's, you know, the royal family are a, a, a bit more popular again. And I think that's a difficult one for British museums, and I'm sure there are equivalents. I decided I was going to publish it in a textbook we've, we've just done, and in fact, um, the rights are so enmeshed in a million legal uh, disputes that it, you can't get it. But, but I think it's a wonderful example of actually just how shocking culturally some of that stuff was and, and how uncomfortable it made people. And that's just one that seems to me it still has that edge, you know, because it, people felt it went too far. And that's what I'm always interested in, those margins of what seems too far at any moment, you know? And that, I think, is, re reflects collections because I think there's all, you know, it's hard for curators like Gail to think, well, what is, what is beyond what's shocking, you know? Sorry, I saw, oh, here we are, yes. I think it's a, that um, 
appreciate your use of the word culture. And so in this case, we're, we're talking generally about popular culture, um, but from this vein of corporate culture, whether it was, was CBS or in this case, Herman Miller. Um, Herman Miller had the fantastic benefit of being direct, although a corporation was directed by a family. And indeed, the family's values became the, the corporation's values. And so that um, although they didn't come from a design education, it was that uh, perhaps began as a happy accident, but that abandonment to design um, and also of being um, um, as early as the 50s committed to being great stewards of the environment. Um, those were um, attitudes that came from the founder of the company. Um, and so those, Mr. Dupree put those um, and sconced them into the DNA of the company and indeed they're, they're still there. And so I think that's the power of, the, um, of an individual or uh, to create cultures or to influence culture. And also, you know, the influence of the counterculture on Herman Miller because, you know, I certainly bought a lounge chair in Ottoman that had rosewood on it in the 1980s. And, you know, it, it is this interrelationship because they're only going to stop using those rose, rosewood when people are telling them it's wrong to do so as well. So I think it's, it, it's a, a, a interesting that, you know, corporate culture doesn't exist on its own. Yes. Uh, with regard to the collections, um, perhaps it's something of a family issue. If the Smithsonian is America's material attic, is the Cooper Hewitt seeing itself as the material critic, and is that the mission going forward? Ah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> point of transition. It's a brilliant question. <laughs> <laughs> Our mission is really to collect across all of the decades and centuries and, and show the continuum of design. So as much as Gail doesn't like those images, it is a curatorial team that comes together and votes first before we then present it to the acquisitions committee. And it is a very, um, t very much a team approach to make sure that we are filling all of the important holes in the collection. So it's not one person, it's really a whole team looking at what is critical to represent design in America's design collection. So it's representative, not just um, having a point of view. That's correct. We have to tell the history of design. There's somebody at the back. I'm just, while we're waiting, um, I think it's interesting that as far as I can see, MoMA does not have a Che Guevara poster, and I think that's because of um, politics. Yet, in I think I'm saying that there isn't any of the famous Che Guevara posters. I think they have, think they have Paul Davis's. Well... It may not be. It's, uh, anyway, it, it just seems to me it's, it's interesting that there's, there's still debate there about what, what is still offensive to, to some people, even though it's the politics of the 60s and 70s. Hi there. Um, Sorry great variety that. tonight, by the way. Um, I, I was actually struck, this isn't so much a question as, as, as it is... Um, just kind of seeing parallels between all of this stuff. And it, because a lot of this has been kind of car compartmentalized, you know, you have highbrow, lowbrow, you know, we, we like to talk about these buckets. But I think it's very striking because Ben, you know, you talked about corporate culture uh, trickling down uh, into popular culture. And then, you know, Stephen, you talk about lowbrow punk, you know, uh, percolating up to, you know, popular culture. Um, as well as you know, the idea of, uh, I think Ben, you said, something that struck me was cross-cultural surprise uh, in relation to, to Nelson. And I kind of, I'm looking at this image right here like that is cross-cultural surprise. You know, you see you know, how many different centuries of typefaces um, you know, that are running through it. And uh, I mean, I don't know, I, I, I guess it's more meditation on you know, culture with a capital C rather than you know, putting it in all these sort of arbitrary buckets. Yeah, again, not a question, just more of a meditation. Thank Thanks. You. I think that was, Thank you. Uh, when we had a chat on the phone, a um, uh, really wonderful discussion, um, all very good points. It's what was the most exciting for all of us is at the, this moment in time, 
Of course, it had precedence well, well in advance, but this multiculturalism, this awareness of a larger world, and the desire to mash it up yeah. um, across disciplines, across, um, across the designers and um, outputs. Well, I can see the classic cut signs coming to me <laughs> from the back, so thank you all for coming.